Okay, so just to um, a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Apologies for the delay. Um, if you want to listen using your audio pane, uh, your telephone rather, then you can dial in on your audio pane. Use select use telephone, and the information and access code will be displayed for you. Um, you will be able to ask questions using your questions pane. Simply type your question and click send, and then we will answer your questions in a Q&A session at the end of the session. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to hand over to Howard Dawes now. Thanks, Charlotte, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to a very sunny and uh, or just that damp, actually, European morning or afternoon. Good um, hi. Um, my name is Howard, Howard Dawes, uh, Senior Environmental Consultant, British Safety Council. Thanks for joining us for um, a session update policy and legislation session. Um, I'm just going to, uh, by way of an introduction, because um, obviously context has somewhat changed in the last couple of days, um, which is very interesting. Uh, so perhaps we might want to say a few words on that. I don't want to be too distracted by it, but although obviously it's really what has happened is really important, um, and I'm not just talking about the Euros um, and anyway football. But no, let's move on to something a bit more prevalent. So, um, what I just want to, by way of an introduction, just talk about um, where we as environmental practitioners might go to for uh, environmental source of, in, of information. You see that on the screen there, um, and in the context of again, some recent announcements, perhaps just make reference to some consultations that might be coming up in the near future that, again, might impact on, on business operations from an environmental perspective. Just give a view from an international, again, international perspective and European, European view, which obviously, um, in, again, in recent days has changed somewhat, um, but, the, but then return to some key policy themes that are in existence at the moment. Um, they may well change, given what's happened. Um, but I just want to perhaps take the opportunity to remind people that perhaps it is business as usual, at least in the short term, and these are the key areas that we need to focus on and do something about. Um, and there's reference there to some key policy instruments that, again, most most of us probably listening in are already aware of, but perhaps there's, you know, at the end, maybe some opportunity to consider some of the changes that might happen in terms of approaches of implementation. Uh, and then just a slide there before handing over to Simon. Um, Simon Colvin from, from Waitmans, who's going to give you some uh, more detailed expert um, update from a, a legal perspective. And hopefully at, at the end we'll have some time for, for a, a, few, a few questions. Okay, let's see if I can move on my slide here now. Here we go. Okay, um, so just by a reminder, most of us probably know where to go for um, environmental information or that you have your own sources sources of, of information but just to just to highlight there is um, uh, a website uh, or portal I should say .gov.uk where we might find some uh, environmental pieces of information uh, my PowerPoint just started let's go to this .gov.uk website let's close that just for a minute um, so this is the welcome.gov.uk website apologies for that screen there um, now it's not an, an obvious place to uh, go in the sh in the short term, or where to go for environmental information. But you can see, hopefully, you can see on my screen here, business, business and self, business and self-employed. Um, that's a portal where businesses can go to in a, in the in the short term, well, to find some environmental information. Click on the link. If you scroll down to the bottom, initially, waste and environmental impact link, and here you have then a list, A to Z list of uh, environmental sources of information. So if you want to know about contaminated land, environmental taxes, um, hazardous waste, etc., then you can click on those links. So I just click on that by way of example. And here's an overview of some guidance and what organizations need to do with respect to management of, of hazardous waste. So if you're a producer or holder of waste, this is what you need to do. If you're a carrier of waste, this is what you need to do. If you're a going to be consigning waste, different types of hazardous waste. So if you're unsure in terms of the types of waste that you have, how do you classify your waste? So in terms of, of where to go for guidance now, this is a really useful portal to go to. Unfortunately, I say unfortunately, but from a practitioner point of view, um, learning and knowing where to go 
is a bit difficult, a bit challenging in the first place. But .gov.uk is the sort of landing page, and then you can click on this on this link here. It's not perhaps the most obvious place. There's another link on here that you can go to. Already highlighted environment and countryside. Again, that's probably more obvious place to visit. Um, more uh, environmental themes there, and again, just a couple of ones highlighted, recycling and waste, wildlife and biodiversity. So again, click on, on these links here, and, you can, and this is to do with waste, so you can again see some information there regarding how to, what you need to do from a waste management point of view, and here's some detailed guidance at the end. Um, so if I go back to the portal, to the landing page, so those are the main two links on there. The other thing, just to highlight though, if you scroll down to the bottom of this particular page, you can see here at the very bottom, on the right hand side, you've got departments and policy. And here you can see links to particular government departments and also policies. So if you click on a department uh, link first, and then the two, perhaps two main uh, government departments to do with environment are um, DEFRA, I, I, I've forgotten who they were then, DEFRA, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and DEC, Department of Energy and Climate Change. Scroll down just a little bit and you can find these particular departments. So Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, you see this is their landing page now. Um, and then if you scroll down to the bottom of this particular page, it outlines what they do and some of their key policy areas, waste and recycling, environmental quality, um, Again, it gives it gives an overview of their main areas of activity. Okay, so if you wanted to know some uh, information on uh, env what is current currently happening in the world of environmental policy, then this is a particular area that that you can go to. Now, apologies a moment ago, my um, Presentation cease, so I'm just going to reload. Many, many apologies, and you can see my going here and here and here and here. Apologies, many apologies for that. Let's see if we can get into this again. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so there's the, there's the link um, for where to go for environmental policy information. Um, just want to put that into context as well, with reference to ISO 14001 2015 in particular. It's really important within the standard now that we have access to information and understand the context of the organization. So what I'm just trying to do here is make a link to perhaps um, we need to determine both internal and external issues. And obviously external issues um, impacting on the business could be changes in policy. So that's what I'm trying to sort of emphasize by way of this introduction is, you know, we as environmental practitioners need to understand where to go for information, understand where to go for uh, any updates on policy, etc. So just want to highlight that in particular. Um, and within the standard, it talks about, you see the, the, the last bullet point there, also consider external, cultural, social, and this is obviously very relevant to what's happened in the last few days, political, legal, and regulatory sort of changes, which could have a direct impact on, on business. So I suppose the message from this first slide is, you know, we need to keep up to date, certainly in the short term, in terms of any actual potential changes in policy and direction from an environmental point of view, and that's to, where to go for information. Um, when I was chatting to colleagues last week about this webinar and sort of, you know, I put this little image on the right-hand side, they're saying, you know, are we in or are we going to be out? It was, it was obviously 50-50, I suppose, there's lots of discussion um, around whether it'd be good or bad to be within Europe or, or outside. Obviously, what's happened has happened now, so we need to um, take stock of that and remain positive, I suppose. Um, <laughs> that might imply what I uh, sort of uh, 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 voted myself as an environmental type person. But um, in the wider context, again, we just need to, from a practitioner point of view, just keep an eye on international policy and just by way of an example and I've uh, got a link there to United Nations Farm Program which is a good source of information um, given perhaps a wider international perspective of environmental policy and law 
give some, some key themes on climate change, on biodiversity, on resource efficiency. And what comes from that, there are links within that in there to actual other websites that talk, go, talk specifically about climate change, for, for example, and perhaps um, how to deal with hazardous substances. So it's quite a useful sort of starting point for UNEP. Um, again, the link to the regional and European policy and law, again, despite the, um, notwithstanding the fact that we sort of are in the process of, of, li of leaving Europe, um, I think again, just an ongoing basis. Actually, thinking about it, you know, companies, businesses will be operating within Europe still, and will have sites in Europe. So, despite the fact we are talking very much perhaps from a UK perspective at the moment, there will be companies, businesses out there that have locations within Europe that they also have need to have regard to European law as well. So, always useful to have access to that, and there's a link there. Um, certain businesses as well will be operating within certain business sectors, um, which also have particular environmental policies for their members. So just one example on the screen, their British Meat Processors Association, um, they have particular policies and strategies for their members to do with climate change, because if you can imagine the, 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 the potential or, or actual impacts of climate change could actually have, and it's perceived to have, a, a negative impact actually on meat, on meat production. Um, so. So they, as, a, as an industry sector, are quite proactive in terms of their own uh, policy strategies that their members need to take into account. And that would become, potentially, again with reference to 14, 14,001, 2015, a potential compliance obligation. So it's just something to be aware of. And finally, um, certainly from a personal and professional point of view, um, we've all got our own preferences in terms of sources of, of information, but Eddie is really useful. Uh, regular updates of, of environmental policy and laws uh, and some news pieces. Now, before handing over to Simon for uh, his sort of expert legal update uh, information, just want to uh, again just to consider and just remind ourselves or get to think about what is policy. So, but there's a strict definite. I say strict definition. There is a definition, a dictionary definition there of what policy is. So, just by by definition, a set of ideas or a plan of what to do in particular situations that have been agreed to officially by a group of people or business organisation, government or political party. Now, the reason why I'm sort of emphasising this is because when, sometimes when we do training, um, there is some confusion between what is policy and what is legislation. So policy is an overarching uh, direction of travel, so this is what we want to achieve, it, if you like, and legislation uh, is a means of achieving that, for example. So they are connected, but they are subtly different, and I suppose from an environmental point of view, um, certainly I would just want so, so practitioners and businesses and, and leaders within those organisations to understand a bit of the difference. So. There's a couple of examples there, which are probably um, I, I just sort of dumped on, on the slide, I suppose, but not, not specifically environmental. But um, from an environmental point of view, we have there is existing UK policy, which is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, those those of you that are already aware, we have an 80, we have a target to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. That is policy. That is that's what we're going to achieve. How we get there is there's a number of ways of achieving it. And if you look at the bottom of this particular slide, you can see some what we call policy instruments. So the four main mechanisms of achieving that, that policy objective is fiscal instruments, things like taxes, um, so almost like an economic incentive to, to do something. Obviously, there's the law, legislation, regulations that are actually demand, it's a command and control approach, you know, we shall do something, businesses are required to do something to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, for, for example, so under the permitting regulations, for example, there's things like on energy efficiency. Um, Market-based is using um, economic um, leverage, I suppose you could say, so um, things like, um, for example, the EU ETS, the Emissions Trading Scheme, is an example of that, cap and trade, so we are given carbon allowances, uh, which is, sets a cap on how much carbon we're allowed to sort of or, or permitted to release, and then if you've got a surplus of carbon allowances, you can trade those on, as it were, on a carbon on a carbon market. And voluntary measures are incentives to do things on a voluntary basis, support through things like RAP, Waste Resources Action, uh, a program perhaps to support business on, uh, implement resource efficiency measures. Um, so those are some, um, some some policy areas. I just wanted just to 
for me, four key areas of policy. Um, again, some of us are probably already familiar with these, but just to sort of highlight the issues, energy and low carbon, there is and continues to be uh, a requirement uh, or government policy on energy, so the energy, uh, as it were, reduction, uh, in particular energy demand reduction, because obviously we want to reduce our carbon emissions. And the context here is we need to, or government needs to provide a reliable and affordable and green and green energy supply. So within that policy framework, there are existing and will continue, and certainly in the short term, measures to encourage us to reduce our energy consumption, be more resource efficient and reduce our carbon emissions. Um, so things like CRC is, is that, well, as long as it, um, well, it's, it's here for the time being, obviously that's changing as well. And Simon might have a few words on that a bit later on. Um, waste is another key policy area and the general policy uh, objective is to reduce and manage waste. So again, encouraging businesses through legislation, perhaps other measures such as tax, so we have something called the landfill tax, that will probably remain as well, to encourage us to reduce waste. Um, and there is this idea of a circular economy, which is sort of in the background, and again, encouraging more, much more resource efficiency. Again, I think there might be some potential changes there, because that was came through European part of European policy as well, and with the with the consequence of, uh, of, of uh, what's happened in the last few days, that might well uh, change, or perhaps certainly become less of a priority to discuss. Um, air and water quality, again, key policy area for, for government to continue to reduce our impacts on that to improve air and water quality. So that's typically achieved through legislative uh, measures, permitting, uh, requirements reduced uh, emissions to to air again through through permitting and also uh, control our consumption of water for example um, and finally biodiversity and the natural environment so again general red, um, legislative approach to here to protect and enhance the environment so typically through planning rules regulations uh, things environmental impact assessments obviously that Interestingly, that actually also EIA in the UK originates from EU law, EU legislation. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that sort of evolves over the next couple of years. Because I understand um, there's a, a, a implementation requirements or some changes in the in the EU in the EU directive. Um, so yeah, so um, I guess in terms of planning, watch watch this space. So just before I hand over to Simon, I think. Um, by way of an introduction, just some, a very short introduction in terms of some, some key policy themes. These are, from a practical point of view, things to do, have access to accurate and reliable sources of information, keep ourselves up to date with the changes. It's going to be very interesting to see how things evolve over the next weeks, months, um, and, and um, to see where the UK positions itself with respect to environment. It hasn't been a, a, a big discussion point up, up until the, the uh, referendum last week, but um, um, it may come to the fore, hopefully, from my point of view, in the, in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, review information sources, keep your colleagues and top manager up to date, keep ourselves up to date through going to conferences, attending webinars such as this, um, speak, to, speak to colleagues as well, obviously. And in respect to the EMS development, some, some, in terms of communication uh, and understanding the context, I'll just highlight some, some key clauses in the standard, the new standard, that this is very relevant to. So 4.1, understand the context, the environmental context for the business. 6.13, uh, compliance obligations, really important legislation and other requirements comes underneath there. And communication refers to, um, so communication, internal and external communication, ensuring we are uh, consistent to, um, and ensure good communication with our colleagues internally as well as our, any of our stakeholders in terms of what, what it might mean for, for them. Gosh, sorry for uh, that rapid introduction. Um, I hope that was useful, but just by way of, um, just by way of an introduction, I'm going to hand over to Simon Colvin now um, for his expert legal Update. So I'll just um, hand over to Simon now, and and thanks very much. We'll take some questions at the end. Over to you, Simon. Thanks very much, Howard. Hopefully, everybody can hear me clearly. Um, okay. Well, Howard and I were planning the session last week in advance of Thursday. Um, Thursday happened, and I've got to admit, I changed what I was going to talk about. Uh, I think it'd be rude not to talk about Brexit uh, and the impact, um, I suppose, from an environmental uh, legislation point of view. Just following on a bit from what Howard was saying, that Howard was talking about a lot about the policy 
um, and where you can find policy, where policy comes from. Uh, when we did the session last year, one of the things that I talked about was something called the Seventh Environmental Action Protocol, which is basically this program that the uh, European Union issues uh, every six or seven years that sets out basically their roadmap for where they're going to go with environmental controls. What we've seen in the UK is very much what I thought I'd call a sort of a policy void, a policy vacuum uh, in recent years, purely because I think the UK government have taken the view that if you've got a, a European Union that's so proactive, well, let's contribute to what they're doing and try and influence that rather than doing things ourselves. I think we're now in a very interesting position whereby we've got that policy void or vacuum. We've been heavily dependent on the European Union for policy, particularly in the environmental arena. We've no longer got that. And so that's something that clearly needs to be acted upon. But I'll, I'll come on to that in more detail uh, when I talk to you about um, what I think the you know the effects of Brexit are going to be and, and perhaps how we can deal with some of those challenges. Okay, so what are the topics I'm going to talk about? Well, as I said, we're going to cover Brexit. Um, I'd like to, like to talk to you about climate change uh, and the Paris Agreement. Um, touch on ESOS, so the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme and the Carbon Reduction Commitment. Howard touched on the fact there that that's due to be abolished uh, in the not too distant future. So just to summarise that for you. Uh, a quick mention of waste crime. Uh, waste crime, huge focus for uh, UK based regulators, not so much impacted by what's going on at a European level. <coughs> So good to talk about that. And finish off just looking at, um, I suppose, the enforcement theme. Um, the environment got its sentencing council guideline back in 2014. I know the health and safety arena got its guideline earlier this year. I suppose I'd like to look at some of the things that have happened in the last couple of years since we had the environmental guideline and the impact and effect that's had on fines and penalties. And perhaps just a few, a few lessons for you to learn from that. What I've tried to do in picking these topics is look at things that people have perhaps asked me questions about, things that I've been talking to clients about, things that I think are topical in the environmental arena, and so hopefully you'll find this interesting. Okay, so Brexit. Um, <laughs> If, if you weren't aware of it, where have you been, what have you been doing? Um, I mean, I woke up on Friday morning to get an early train down to London, uh, and I suppose went through a few emotions on Friday, I suppose initially shock and disbelief, when I picked up my phone and various news alerts had come through to say, it uh, looks like the Leave vote had won. As the day went on, I got a bit, I got a bit angry, got quite worried, uh, but I suppose over the weekend and the first few days of this week, I suppose it's just an acceptance, well, not going to change what's happened, so, you know, how can we, how can we embrace it, how can we deal with it? Um, before we move on to look at the actual effects, I suppose I think it, for me it helps to look at how we've got here uh, and what's happened. Um, so just a very quick sort of summary of, of what's happened and, and how we've got here. We've been a member of the European Union since 1973, so for a considerable period. But last year, uh, it was David Cameron and the Conservative Party manifesto. Uh, they said, look, we're going to offer uh, the, the voters an in-out vote before the end of 2017. Uh, they brought about the EU Referendum Act, which uh, got Royal Assent at the end of last year, and that set out, if you like, the framework for a referendum. And in the meantime, you've got David Cameron running around Europe uh, trying to get a special deal for us in terms of our, our participation in the European Union. David comes back in February and says, right, I've got this deal. Uh, and at the time, I think, you know, and I was one of the people commentating on this, his view was, look, if we can have a very quick referendum, then actually it doesn't give people the time to drill down into the detail of the deal that I've managed to negotiate. Uh, he thought that was probably a good thing, uh, and so went for what you could call a snap referendum, uh, which is on the 23rd of June. We all know the result of that. Relatively close, 51.9% to 48.1%, I think it was 1.5 million people sort of between those two categories, uh, but we voted to leave. Uh, interesting to note that the vote has no legal effect pursuant to the EU Referendum Act. The Act itself doesn't actually say what happens if we vote to stay or vote to go. So the, the, the leave vote doesn't actually have legal effect, but the government have come out quite clearly and said, look, we've got a democratic duty to give effect, uh, I suppose, to the will of the people. Uh, so the government said they're going to follow through on that. I think Howard and I were talking about this, but I think the concern is this has all happened really quickly. If you look at, you know, from last summer to this summer to now the fact we voted to leave, it's been a very short time scale in relation to something which is of fundamental importance and, and something that, you know, is, I suppose so much part of our of, of our framework and our legal framework. And if I'm honest, I don't think many people thought it would happen, and therefore I don't think many people are properly prepared for it, which is why we've now got a lot of politicians scratching their heads actually thinking, well, okay, this has happened, what do we do now? Uh, so in a difficult, difficult spot. Helps to just quickly talk about the mechanism for departure, which is Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union, or the, the Lisbon Treaty. Um, just a quick sort of recap of what that provides for. Um, Article 50 says... 
uh, 50 subparagraph 1 says that member state can decide to leave uh, and if they want to if a member state wants to leave they have to tell the European Council and then you go through this process of negotiating the agreement for exit uh, and also looking at what the future relationship is going to be like <coughs> You might have read this or heard this elsewhere, but basically a member state leaves when that agreement takes effect or on the expiry of two years from the point of notification. That two-year period can be extended uh, by a unanimous vote of other member states. The thoughts of many commentators uh, that I've seen um, so, so far are that you're not going to get all the member states agreeing to give the UK more time, which is why at the moment there's a lot of, if you like, prevarication going on uh, by David Cameron by others in terms of when we trigger that two-year period, because what they're trying to do actually is buy some time now to work out what their game plan is, what do we think we can actually achieve, what do we want to go in and ask for, and once we're clear on that, then it's at that point that we approach the European Council and trigger that two-year period. They don't want to trigger it now and spend the first year or 18 months trying to work out what it is we want, uh, because then you know you've wasted a lot of time and missed an opportunity. So that's that's part of the reason as to why we're seeing all this ongoing discussion at the moment. Um, I'm going to jump around in terms of my bullet points a little bit. Um, I suppose just quickly, you know, what are we going to see happen in the UK? Well, I've said we're not going to see any rush in terms of uh, entering into and triggering that two-year pro discussion process. Um, if you listen to politicians, David Cameron's clearly come out and said, look, we're not going to do that until uh, we've got a new leader of the Conservative Party, a new Prime Minister. Is that going to be Boris Johnson? Possibly. Um, are we going to have a general election in the autumn? Possibly. Uh, that's one view. Um, but then we go into that negotiation process. Now, there's some discussion around whether or not, when we get a deal back from the European Union, we should then be able to have either a second referendum or some other vote on whether or not uh, we accept that or we don't. And if we don't like it, can we then withdraw the Article 50 notice? Really interesting points. Uh, there's nothing to say within the Treaty on the European Union that you can't withdraw an Article 50 notice, but again, a lot of the discussion and, and commentary that I've seen says that you, you couldn't do that. It wouldn't be politically acceptable. Um, could we have a second referendum on the acceptance of the New Deal? I know Jeremy Hunt's talking about it at the moment in terms of his own bid for leadership of the Conservative Party. Again, a lot of commentators just think there's, there's no way you could do that because, again, if you look at the timescales we've got, it's just not going to be feasible. It's going to take a lot of time to actually get to the point where we know what we want to do. You've then got to negotiate that agreement. It's then got to go through the agreement of the European Commission, Council, European Parliament. I, I just don't foresee that happening. So um, other factors, the Scotland and Gibraltar factor, what influence they have over this at the moment. You've got Nicola Sturgeon saying, well, look, OK, we can potentially veto um, the UK leaving the European Union. I don't know whether that's true or not. I think she's perhaps just um, positioning herself for a, a second referendum on Scottish independence. But So there's lots of unknowns out there in terms of what's happening. In terms of what we do know from an environmental sort of legal perspective, little's going to change for the next two and a half to three years. It's going to be business as usual. We're going to have the same legal regime. We're going to be subject to the same EU legal controls. Little is going to change. Uh, and I think that's, that's one thing that we, we do know uh, as part of all of this. Um, when will things change from an environmental perspective? Um, <clears throat> again, I think that's it's an interesting discussion, but the general thinking at the moment is that if you look at um, what is going to dictate what environmental controls we need to comply with in the future and which ones we don't need to comply with, it's very much going to depend on the trade agreement that we enter into. And because we're not going to know that for two and a half, three years, perhaps more, it's not going to be until that point that actually we're in a position to say, OK, it's going to be th these bits of European legislation that are going to have to remain that we're going to have to continue to comply with. And it's going to be these that we no longer need uh, and perhaps can get rid of or no longer require. So yeah, business as usual for the next two, three years. At that point, once we know what the framework structure is going to be, we can look at perhaps deciding what environmental laws can stay and which can go. Um, so that's a bit of a timeline for you. What have we seen from uh, environmental regulators so far? Um, we've seen the Environment Agency and CEPA come out with some comments in ENDS uh, earlier in the week saying business as usual, nothing going to change. Um, interesting, the Financial Conduct Authority, so a similar body to the Environment Agency but dealing with the financial sector, issued a statement on Twitter saying, yep, nothing going to change, it's all going to stay the same, business as usual, we expect businesses to comply with their obligations. So I think that's very much clearly the policy at the moment. What I would say, and I expect this to happen, is some primary legislation, so perhaps a new Act of Parliament in the next six months, just clearly setting that out, saying, look, until we leave, nothing is going to change, everything remains the same. And that will probably involve 
repealing or at least amending the European Communities Act, which provides the supremacy of EU law, at least addressing that and saying, look, that continues for this period of time, and then we will revisit it once we decide to leave and look to what we're going to do. Um, what can you do? Um, and I'll just say I could, talk, I could talk about a subject for a long time, but I'm conscious I need to get on to a few other matters as well. Um, what can you do? I think for me it's really about either the companies that you work for or the clients you're advising. You need to identify what environmental legislation they're subject to and then perhaps look at where the roots of that legislation comes from. So is it sort of EU-derived legislation or is it just UK-specific? Does it relate to perhaps trade that they do with Europe? Does that company or does your company perhaps have operations in the UK and in Europe? Because I think when you start to break it down in that way, you start to get a feel for how you're going to sit and how you're going to fare in the future. Because clearly, if you're trading with countries in Europe, you're going to continue to be subject to some of their obligations in terms of products that you might supply them. If you've got operations in those countries, you might want to have standard, I suppose, standard process and standard approach across all of your operations within the European Union and the UK. So you can start to get a feel for where things are going to go in the future. But that's the best advice I can give you at the moment. You've got some time. Nothing's going to change in the immediate future. Don't stick your head in the sand and start looking at it now. Okay, so let's move on from Brexit. Climate change. Um, looking at climate change, so the questions I've had around this were, look, there was a lot of press coverage about the Paris Climate Change Agreement before Christmas, um, but what's happened to it? Uh, you might have seen in the press that uh, back in April it was ratified. Uh, I think it had more signatories than any other international climate change agreement seen in the past, so a lot of support for it. And because of that level of support and the level of interest, the suggestion is it could actually come into effect two years earlier, which would actually be in 2018. Now, in terms of the so what, I've got some points about the EU there, but actually that's not particularly relevant to us. Um, Previously, the way this would have worked would have been that those obligations would have flowed down through the EU and to us as a member state, and so would have been subject to whatever happened at that level. But actually now, obviously we're going to sit outside that, at least we will in the future, uh, and we've got to think about what our own obligations are. I don't think it's going to change significantly, because we had to set out what our own intended uh, contribution was going to be, which is this INDC reference. That is what it is. We sent that to the EU. We committed to that externally. So that's going to remain. That will stay the same. And this is really interesting because actually the, the fifth carbon budget is due to be published in the next couple of days. Uh, Amber Rudd's already been tweeting this morning. Uh, Amber Rudd is the uh, Environment Secretary. Has been tweeting this morning about uh, the fact that you know it is business as usual. The publication of the fifth carbon budget will demonstrate that, and she wants the UK to be set its set its stall out as a, a leading nation in terms of uh, carbon carbon reduction. So let's let's see what comes. You know, I think our, hands, our lives are in the hands of the politicians at the moment in terms of how they manage this process and you know, what Amber Rudd and, and the, uh, the Climate Change Committee do uh, in the coming days is going to be very interesting uh, from that perspective. In terms of what I think is going to change as a result of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, if I'm honest, I don't think a huge amount. I think we're on a trajectory, we're on a path. Howard talked about the Climate Change Act, the fact that that's got commitments to 80% reduction by 2050. We're on that path, and really all we're seeing at the moment is, us, I suppose, the, the committees and the politicians talking about how we get there. Um, but I don't see fundamental change in the approach that we've got at the moment. I do think what we'll need is sort of to plug this policy gap that we talked about before, though. Okay, uh, abolition of the CRC scheme. Um, carbon reduction commitment scheme, many people might be, remember this, be familiar with it, but essentially it was introduced in 2010. Uh, the idea was to try and drive uh, carbon reduction, uh, energy intensive businesses, property sector, buildings. It was a very painful process to go through to get to the uh, regime that we had. Um, but as soon as it was introduced, lots of criticism, lots of dislike. Uh, it wasn't working particularly well. Uh, it went through, or it's been through, a series of changes to now. Uh, people, many people have just said it's a tax. It doesn't work particularly well. And what we had earlier this year was actually the government coming out, making an announcements, saying, look, we're going to scrap the scheme altogether, and we're going to go for something different. So CRC goes from October 2019, so just over three years' time. And what they're going to introduce from earlier that year, April 2019, is a an extended climate change levy scheme. And I'll talk to you in a minute about what, what climate change levy is if you don't know. Uh, but what they promised is later this year a consultation on a simplified energy and carbon reporting framework that would come in, in April 2019. Now, what's happened in terms of Brexit has blown a big hole on that. You'll see why in a second. But let, let me quickly talk about the climate change levy. So what is it? Well, in effect, it's a tax on energy consumption. Um, the amount paid depends on the amount you consume. And really, it's designed to encourage the move away from gas to electricity. So the levy is higher on gas and lower on electricity. Um, 
it's really for energy intensive companies um, so there's a threshold uh, below which you're not subject to above which you are and it's collected by energy companies on behalf of the government and then they, they pay the money on to, to the government um, the way it works is that you can benefit from a discount on the levy if you've got one of these CCAs which is a climate change agreement and the way these climate change agreements work are that you might have a sector, say for example the food and drink sector, which will have a, an overarching or an umbrella agreement with the government in terms of, uh, I suppose, the, the carbon reduction benefits and, and, I suppose, obligations that their members would deliver. And then that sector then has individual agreements with individual businesses. And what you have is basically a company has to deliver on certain improvements and commitments over a period of time. And if it does that and it's certified to have achieved those, then it can benefit from this discount on the levy. If it doesn't, it has to pay the full, full levy. And financially, that can be quite costly for a company. So it's, it's beneficial for them to meet their targets and to do that. And so what the government are really saying is, look, we're going to use this levy. We're going to expand it. We're going to drop that threshold down so you actually capture more people within this regime. And therefore, more people are going to, have to enter into these climate change agreements and look at how they can improve their operations so they can benefit from the levy because if they don't, it's going to cost them and it's going to hit them in the pocket. There are some exemptions around this. There's been a lot of talk about the steel industry on the, on the, on the television recently and the, the problems they've been having. So certain industries do benefit from an exemption, but, but generally others don't, and you have to have these climate change agreements. There's going to be, well, this is on the assumption all of this remains, and you'll see why it might not in a second, but if all of this remains, there's going to be a steep learning curve to go through for a number of businesses in terms of understanding how the climate change levy works and what climate change agreements are. So let's look at what this new reporting framework was meant to be. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the with ESOS, the Energy Saving Opportunities Scheme. Um, this was derived from a, an EU piece of legislation, the Energy Efficiency Directive. It was something that the UK government up until last Thursday had limited discretion in relation to. And because of that, because it formed the central pillar of what this new reporting framework was going to be. So everything was going to be built around ESOS. After Thursday, who knows what's going to happen. So I'm going to talk to you about what I think will happen if it stays as business as usual, but I think this is one of those things that's just going to be in the mix as to how the government wants to address it and where they go with it. Um, so ESOS, very simple, you have to calculate uh, how much energy you consumed, you have to audit that consumption and identify saving opportunities. Very simple. Uh, you didn't have to report on that, you just had to say you've done that and register with the Environment Agency to say you completed your audit and done those things. The new framework, the idea would be that you would actually capture a large number of businesses. So at the moment with an ESOS it's 250 employees or more or uh, turnover of 50 million euros. The idea is they bring those thresholds down to capture more people. Uh, the new framework would have a stricter and more in-depth reporting framework. At the moment, all you have to do is say we've complied, and if you want to, you could disclose some voluntary data, but it didn't go beyond that. The suspicion is very much that actually the reporting requirements would go much further and actually require you to report on your consumption data and the steps that you're taking to improve your performance. And the final thing is in terms of the frequency of reporting. At the moment under ESOS there's a four-year reporting cycle, four-year cycle. The expectation is that it would be brought into an annual process and it would be more frequent in, in, in that way. But again, as I said, this is one of the things that's in the mix because it's derived from EU law. Will we see a change? Will we see the government go down a different route? Perhaps, perhaps not. We'll have to wait and see. But this is very much the new regime and it's very much a way of the government plugging a gap in their finances because if CRC goes, they lose a, a billion pounds, approximately a billion pounds a year in terms of tax revenue. They need to do something to replace that. So we will see something uh, in a new form in 2019, uh, but it's just what form it's going to take. Is it going to be this or something slightly different? All right, waste crime. Um, Waste crime, hugely important topic at the moment. Uh, Environment Agency, uh, other regulators having a huge push on it. It costs the country a lot of money, uh, estimated to be billions uh, across the course of a year uh, through people who perhaps uh, don't do things properly or unscrupulous and set out to commit offences uh, intentionally. Bit of a, I suppose, sort of background information. I think it helps to look at what is waste because some people fall down on that ground. A couple of case studies, if you like, as to what is waste, what isn't. Uh, I was doing some work with a, uh, a large vehicle manufacturer, a global company. Um, they were exiting a site, demolishing a building. Um, it was a leased site. So they're passing the site back to the landlord. Um, landlord says to, to my clients, um, in demolishing that building, you're going to be crushing bricks and things and producing a sort of a granular aggregate. Can we have some of that material uh, to use in the future to develop the site? My client says, fine, no problem at all. Until I say, hang on a second, have you thought about the fact that material could be waste? 
And if it is, you need to follow a certain process to make sure that you do things properly in terms of duty of care and any permits or exemptions that you might require to handle it and, and treat it and transport it. They hadn't even it hadn't crossed their minds. And people tend to think that waste is something that oh well, you know, I'm th I'm throwing it away. I've got no use for it. That's not the case. It's an objective test, and it's whether or not you discard or intend to discard that material. Whether or not it's got a value really doesn't matter, so you've got to be very careful in this area. Who is responsible for waste? Well, it's the producer or, or the holder for the time being. And it's very important to know that that responsibility doesn't end when you give it to somebody else, particularly from, a, I suppose, a, a statutory or a point of view uh, in terms of legislation. And many people make this mistake. They think, oh, well, I've got an agreement with X, and I've passed the material to them, and they're going to deal with it and get rid of it for me. That doesn't matter, because there's this thing called the duty of care. And the way the duty of care works is it applies from the first person that produces the waste to the last person to either dispose of it or recover it, and everybody in between. And you can't, if you like, um, remove yourself from that duty. Uh, that duty is always there until the waste is properly disposed of or recovered, and that's that's done sort of appropriately pursuant to environmental laws. And at that point, the produced responsibility comes to an end. But until that happens, it doesn't. And it doesn't matter what agreement you've got in place. It doesn't matter what documents you've got to say that it's their responsibility. The courts and the regulators don't care, and things like the duty of care will override that and make you responsible. So you need to be important, you know, aware of that. I would add that the duty of care, there was some revised guidance that was issued uh, early this year. Um, the guidance was actually shortened. Um, the view on the previous duty of care guidance would it, was that it wasn't great, it needed more detail. Um, so the fact that new guidance is actually shorter, again, I think there's some concern around that um, and people don't think it, it's as good as it could have been uh, and perhaps the duty isn't used appropriately on many occasions. But uh, that, that's perhaps another discussion. Another important thing to highlight to you is the operation of Regulation 12 and 38 of the Environmental Permitting Regulations. And basically, the Environmental Permitting Regulations operate to say, look, you need a permit to undertake certain activities activities that could impact on the environment. If you don't have one, that's an offence. And so in the waste arena, uh, the way it works is to say that certain activities with waste are regulated. If you don't have a permit, that's an offence. And you can be guilty of an offence either if you sort of cause that or if you knowingly permit it. And that's what I want to focus on, this idea of knowingly permit, because there have been some more cases on this recently that have looked at that concept of knowingly permit. And what we've seen, basically, is the courts take the view that you don't actually need to know about the illegality of an activity. So if somebody's treating material on your behalf or doing something on your behalf, and you know that they're doing that activity, but you don't know it's illegal, that's enough to make you criminally responsible. And there have been a couple of cases that have proved that point where landlords have been made responsible for activities of a tenant on their behalf or um, an employer has been made responsible for activities of a contractor on their behalf. It's enough to know about the activity. You don't need to know that perhaps they're doing a breach of environmental law, that they need an environmental permit. You just need to know about the activity. And again, so, so beware of that. It doesn't matter what contract you've got in place. Again, that can't, in effect, take you out of your legal duties and responsibilities. You're still subject to those. So important to bear that in mind. Okay, so this is the last topic, uh, and this is a quick enforcement update. Um, now, the health and safety arena, you got your new sensing council guideline early this year. Uh, the environmental arena has had their guideline uh, going back to, uh, I think, with, you know, July uh, 2014, uh, the environmental guideline came into effect. And I suppose what I want to do is just give you a quick quick sort of history lesson about why it's here, what it's meant to do, and then look at what the effect has been. So. On the environmental side, uh, two things. One is environmental sentences imposed by courts across the country were seen not to be consistent. Uh, you take one set of facts and circumstances before a court in the northeast of the country, you get one fine. Do the same facts and circumstances, court in the southwest, different outcome. Government regulators didn't like that, so they want to change it. Also, uh, belief of the environmental regulators that the fines and penalties courts were imposing were too low. They weren't exercising their sentencing powers appropriately, so lots of lobbying went on to try and introduce a new guideline that changed that and pushed up fines and penalties. So, lo and behold, we got a, a new environmental guideline in 2014. Um, safety sets having the desired effect, and I'll come on to that in a second. Um, the way the guideline works is it basically looks at a company, uh, puts you in a, into a category based on your turnover, uh, and then from that you look at the level of harm which is ranked from one to four, as you can hopefully see on the slide there, uh, and then you look at the culpability. So you've got deliberate, reckless, negligent, or low and over culpability. And that really gives you a, a starting point, and then you go from there in terms of a range. 
Important to note that if you're what's called a very large organization, so your turnover is significant in excess of 50 million pounds, you don't have one of these tables. These tables don't exist. And actually, you're back at the whim of the court in an uncertain area. There are some discussions going on at the moment with the Sensing Council because they're considering revising the guideline at the moment. They had a commitment to look at it two years, two years after its introduction. And one of the things that's being looked at is whether or not there should be a table for these very large organizations. No conclusions on that yet, but that, that's being considered. Um, so, what have we seen uh, in terms of the guideline? Uh, one of the most interesting cases to look at was a Thames Water case from last year. Uh, this was the first opportunity the Court of Appeal had had to consider the effect of the new guideline, and they gave some pretty clear, unequivocal views in terms of what their expectations are. Headline summary is that they think fines of £100 million plus might be appropriate for certain environmental offences. They were really encouraging the courts to flex their muscles. Uh, and use the new powers that they've been given appropriately. Where they're trying to go is, I mean, people might have seen in the press that just a couple of weeks ago, Scottish Power got an £18 million fine from Ofgem for some customer-related breaches. Well, the courts are really saying that if you can get an £18 million fine for, you know, I suppose, upsetting customers in a particular way and perhaps not treating them fairly, surely a fine for some, an environmental offence by a large company should be on a par with that or in excess of that. And that's where they're trying to drive this. There's a real, real clear direction of travel fines and penalties. And I think that's something that you will see play out under the health and safety guidelines as well. I know that's really happening. I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to flip forward to the next slide so you can really see the, the trends uh, since the introduction of the guideline. There was a very interesting article in The Guardian uh, on this uh, quite recently, and I've, I've pinched some of their, I suppose, analysis of it. But what they did was they looked from 2005 to 2013 at the 10 biggest water companies, and it's those are the companies that, I suppose, have been impacted most by this. But they said in that eight-year period, there have been more than 1,000 environmental incidents, water pollution incidents, and those businesses, companies, have been fined a total of only three and a half million pounds. But since the introduction of the guideline in July uh, 2014, the eight biggest fines alone total five million pound plus. And in the last six months, we've seen a number of million pound plus fines on a standalone basis. So you can clearly see the complete change in approach uh, that we've had uh, from the purposes of sentencing. Um, and I think that's only set to, you know, they're only set to increase. Looking at the big companies there, it's safe to say that actually the effect has been the same for you know, medium-sized companies and smaller companies as well. I was talking to a construction company last week and gave them examples of a couple of cases that were pertinent to them in terms of water pollution and uh, another waste-related offence. And although we weren't talking about millions of pounds, we'd certainly gone from tens of thousands of pounds to hundreds of thousands of pounds in terms of the fines that they would be faced with if they got something wrong as a result of this new guideline. So you can see it's really biting, it's starting to bite, and it's having the desired effect from the government and the regulator's point of view. A quick top tip in relation to this, and I wish people would do more, uh, and, and people should take this advice on board, is that all companies, or well, most companies, will have some sort of incident response protocol in place to deal with environmental incidents or health and safety incidents. You might write reports following those sorts of incidents. Make sure that your reports and your approach follows the Sentencing Council guidelines in terms of their approach, uh, the language they use, the way they approach sentencing. Because actually, if you reverse engineer it and look at those things and put those things in your report at the outset, you can really, really, really make a difference as you work your way through the process in terms of what any outcome might be. If the worst does happen, you are prosecuted and it does end up before a court. Because everything you've done in those very early days is completely streamlined with the new guideline and it will neatly fit into what the court are looking at and what the court are doing. And you'll be ready armed with the information that they need so that you can hopefully persuade them to, I suppose, be lenient with you in terms of any fines or penalties they impose. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, I know I've run a little bit over in terms of my allotted time, but I'm conscious we do have hopefully 10 minutes left or more for a few questions. So I'll hand you back to Howard and Charlotte, uh, and then we can we can go from there. But thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Simon. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, so I think this is probably one for Simon, um, and it's how do you think that businesses should prepare for the final Brexit? What are the risks and opportunities? 
So how should businesses prepare for Brexit? Um, I'd, I'd go back to the point I made in terms of the practical steps people should take. Don't don't stick your head in the sand. Don't think, oh, this is all terrible. It's just too much. Uh, it's, it's too big for me to take on. Um, how does talking at the outset about um, ISO 14001, if companies do have environmental management systems, they will have a register of the different bits of law that they are subject to. And what you need to do is look at those and start analysing a do they come purely from UK or do they have an EU influence? Which category do they fall into? And then actually start looking at what you do as a business. Do you just trade solely in the UK and do you not deal with anybody else? Or if you do trade with the European Union or globally or if you've got operations in other jurisdictions, then start to think about that. And then you can start to piece together, if you like, this jigsaw so that you've got an understanding of where what, what your baseline position is. And then clearly, as I said, I don't think from a legal point of view anything is going to change over the next two to three years. I think what we've got will remain very much the same. But I think is what, we're, what we are going to see is very much what the direction of travel is going to be. So you can start, Chris, you've got your baseline, you know what you're working with, that's your platform. Then as things come through over the next two to three years about what's likely to happen in the future, you can start doing some crystal ball gazing and some thought processes about how it's going to impact you and what you need to do. But once you've got your baseline, once that information starts to come through, just engage with your customers and your clients. Talk to your colleagues, as Howard said, you know, participate in these sorts of webinars, but engage with customers and clients, because for me, those are the most important things, aren't they? And if you can understand what their concerns are in relation to these sorts of things, and you can then have a two-way you know, conversation about, well, how's that going to affect the services you're providing to them or the products you're delivering to them? And you can hopefully be one step ahead of things that are going to come through, because that's the worst thing. You don't want to be sort of have knee-jerk reactions, reactive. You want to be as proactive as you possibly can so that, you know, you know, you never know. There might be some opportunities within this for businesses. Undoubtedly, there will be. And if you are proactive and you're ahead of the game, you might be able to identify those. And, and while it might all seem doom and gloom at the moment, you know, you, you might do well out of it. You never know. Okay, thanks, Simon. And another question. Um, were the UK greenhouse gas reduction targets set by Europe or the UK? That might be one for Howard. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, so, question. Were the, the UK greenhouse gas reduction targets set by Europe or the UK. Um, the, for the UK specifically, they were set by the UK, uh, but obviously in the context and the framework of the international and the, and the European agreements. So um, Simon mentioned it actually in terms of uh, the government is just about to uh, announce, if that's the right word, its, it's fifth, carbon, fifth carbon budget. So I understand that's, that will run from 20 was it 2028 to 2032? And that, and the, and the context for that is the target under we, under that regime is that we're going to hope, or well, the target is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 57% by 2030. Um, just to just to, just to put that into context as well, we've already achieved a 36%. I understand 36% reduction by 2014, and we're already within a, a current. Um, carbon budget by which we need to achieve a 52% reduction by 2025. So there's, sorry, there's lots of numbers and, and figures here, but um, yeah, for the UK, um, set by the UK, but I guess, just, sorry, Simon. I was just going to say, Howard, because what we've got in the UK, we've got the Climate Change Act, and the government at the time were really keen to point out that we were the first country in the world to have this legally binding uh, greenhouse gas reduction target, which they'd set themselves in this piece of legislation. So to an extent, you know, how spot on it was, it was, you know, Europe was setting their own targets, and we weren't sort of departing from that too much, but they were quite keen to have their own act that set that out and have their own press process, which we're, we're now going through. So in one sense... That's something that's likely to continue sort of business as usual, which is you know perhaps why we've seen this announcement from Amber Rudd that the fifth budget will be announced tomorrow, and it yeah it's just going to continue. It's not going to stop. Sure, yeah, and and just just for um, from a regulatory point of view, I'm just thinking myself that um, in some of the discussions that I've had in the last few days, some of the some of the uh, European laws, in fact, and correct me if I'm wrong, Simon, but sort of the uh, things like the permitting regs. If we go back to 1990, the environment Medical Protection Act Part 1 and to the, some sort of, in terms of the regime that was introduced and the authorizations as it used to be called, the integrated pollution control regime was, in fact, I imagine, had a lot of influence over European law that was then adopted subsequently. True? It's, yeah, no, really interesting point. So, yeah, I mean, we, and it's, it's a point that applies across quite a lot of areas in that, particularly in the environmental field, 
examples, uh, the UK has led the European Union uh, in terms of its development policy and legislation, you know, environment permitting is, is a key example. So we had environmental permits, um, sorry, we had things like waste management licenses and the like. We went to the PPC regime, which was our own, and then that converted into IPPC, which is the European regime. So something that we developed and that evolved in the UK, the model was very much taken on at European level. And I suppose that's going to be one of the interesting things to see how it plays out because we've led in a lot of areas. If we do end up in one of these trade agreements that says actually we're still subject to European legislation and we've got no influence over it and we're one of the sort of leading countries when it came to the direction of travel for European or sorry environmental controls, what's going to happen? Are we actually going to be worse off in the environmental arena? There's a school of thought that definitely thinks so. Um, but we'll have to see what, what comes. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Um if a CCA is in place for your industry, Simon, does this not disadvantage those businesses who have already delivered savings and reduced their footprint prior to its introduction? Okay, um, so turning my head back to CCAs, there is there is a mechanism. So under under a lot of these regimes, there's a mechanism that reflects steps that you've already taken, and so you're not disadvantaged if you like. Say if you know this year you. you take a lot of action to improve your performance, but then suddenly you, en you, join the, you enter into an agreement to join the scheme next year, and actually there's then very little, very little room for you to improve. You aren't, if you like, disadvantaged because you've made such a sort of a huge leap initially. There's a mechanism, there's a way of taking account of those sorts of things in all of these schemes. Um, so, yeah, I, as long as it's clearly documented and you know what you've done and it's, it's clearly set out, what they don't want to do is say to people, actually, don't do anything for the next few years. Wait till this comes in, then go into the regime and actually have a stellar performance in your first year. But that's only because you've done nothing in the sort of pre previous sort of two or three years. I think that's that's been a common issue amongst all of these sort of carbon saving type regimes, whether it's CRC, ESOS, those sorts of things. And so they have a mechanism that, that I suppose deals with that. If, if, if you know, for want of a better better, better explanation. Okay, thanks very much. I think that's the questions we've got time for. Um, a lot of people have asked during the presentation whether the slides were made available. I will be sending them round after the presentation has finished to your email addresses that you've registered for and we'll also have a recording on our website. So um, just to remind you, there's plenty of ways that you can keep up to date with what's happening at British Safety Council. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, our videos on YouTube. This webinar will be on YouTube as well. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.